Seattle. It's Wednesday, January 15th. We're looking at a high of 43 and a low of 34 in the Washington State area today with scattered clouds and a chance of light snow arriving early afternoon. Seemed like spring had arrived yesterday. It really did. Beautiful. We hit uh, 56 out of SeaTac. It's going to be mild again today, but not quite that warm and not quite as sunny. As a matter of fact, we saw the high clouds rolling in yesterday afternoon. Later in the week, we'll see temperatures dropping back probably into the uh, mid 40s, a bit closer to normal for this time of the year. That heavy moment today when the Chief Justice arrived to be sworn in to preside over the impeachment trial of President Trump. Australia has always had wildfires, but this year started earlier. It's a new type of coronavirus. The World Health Organization believes the discovery will help authorities around the world detect and respond to outbreaks. And the Oscar goes to Parasite. Perry says he had no other option but to cut most of his royal ties. Now to growing concerns about the deadly coronavirus officially hitting the U.S. Here's what we know. A Washington state resident fell ill after returning from Wuhan, China, where the outbreak began. He will remain in isolation for at least the next couple of days. They will continue to monitor him as well as the health care providers and patients he came into contact with after testing positive for the coronavirus. The 50th annual World Economic Forum gets underway in earnest today, and uh, there's a course in Davos, Switzerland. It's great to see you. Thank you for joining us again in Davos. We've done this before. That's right. Before we get started, the CDC uh, has identified a case of coronavirus uh, in Washington state. Have you been briefed by the CDC? I have. Are there words about a pandemic at this point? No, we're not at all, and uh, we're, we have it totally under control. It's one person coming in from China and we have it under control. It's gonna be just fine. You know, all the people who've been working on pandemics and trying to predict them, trying to understand them, having watched this one unfold, like it's eerily familiar. It really is unfolding just the way other contagions of novel disease have unfolded. But one thing is hugely different and that no one predicted, which is the absolutely chaotic response of the U.S. government. Good morning, America. And with us this morning is Dr. Anthony Fauci. What can you tell the American people uh, about what's going on? Should they be scared? Uh, I don't think so. The American people should not be worried or frightened by this. It's a very, very low risk to the United States. I would characterize that initial period as a period of denial. There really was a belief that it couldn't happen here. There's just another one of those stories about unfortunate things that happen far away. America, we're seeing it as a problem over there, a Chinese problem. They thought it would be contained. They thought America would be impervious to it. So you know, very much a downplaying of the situation by many people. It isn't something that the American public needs to worry about or be frightened about. 
because we have ways of preparing, of screening, just like SARS, we have the possibility with good public health measures of hopefully getting control of it. The first failure of the government response is in that first month or two, not treating this as something that's exceptional. That is a reflection on everyone around Trump, but it's also a reflection on Trump because there were efforts to brief him. A memo from trade advisor Peter Navarro in January warned that failure to contain a coronavirus outbreak could lead to hundreds of thousands of deaths and trillions of dollars in economic losses. It came during a period when Mr. Trump was playing down the risks to the United States. And he would later go on to say that no one could have predicted such a devastating outcome. They tried for weeks to brief the president and couldn't actually get in front of him. Part of it is, I think, just the president's inability to see it coming, his inability to listen. Part of it is his own politics, worrying about the economy, worrying about his reelection. We are making it greater every single day. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is confirming the first case of human-to-human -human transmission in the United States of the novel coronavirus. It appears it would be in conjunction with that case that had been confirmed in a person who traveled uh, back to Chicago from Wuhan, China. They say right now they do still believe that the immediate risk to the American public is low. Just moments ago, the White House announcing that it has created a coronavirus task force, sir. Its aim, we are told, is to monitor, to contain and to mitigate the spread of the virus in the United States. Today, the World Health Organization declaring a global health emergency. There are now more than 7,700 confirmed cases worldwide. The death toll climbing to 170 in China, where cases are now confirmed in every province and 20 countries around the world. Today, the president has signed a presidential proclamation temporarily suspending the entry into the United States of foreign nationals who pose a risk of transmitting the 2019 novel coronavirus. As a result, foreign nationals, other than immediate family of U.S. citizens and permanent residents who have traveled in China within the last 14 days, will be denied entry into the United States for this time. We did a travel ban, but only for travelers from first Wuhan and then China. Meanwhile, the virus already had traveled to a number of different countries, including in Europe. And there was people coming from Europe directly into the all over the United States, and there was no barriers whatsoever. The problem is that travel bans are not very good at banning either viruses or it actually travel. So they tend to be very porous. They can be circumvented by people who really want to get somewhere. They'll take alternative routes or they'll hide symptoms. They can actually generate travel. If you know a travel ban is coming, people tend to rush to the place that they might otherwise be forbidden from entering. And there were so many exemptions that many people made it through. We assumed if we kept Chinese nationals out, the problem would be solved. For a very long time, the administration has seen the danger as being a characteristic of non-nationals, as opposed to a virus that can infect anyone and that can travel with anyone. Why do you keep calling this the Chinese virus? Because it comes from China. Racist. It's not racist at all, no, not at all. It comes from China. I think the response is also driven by the president's own political philosophy, you know, about xenophobia and immigration, and those being such central elements of his political approach, that his answer was, close it off from China, without realizing that it was already here. Travel bans also create a false sense of security. Um, countries that use travel bans might be falsely assured and thus fail to implement the measures that will actually prevent viruses from spreading within their borders. And that seems to have been the case with the US.
Scientists and doctors cannot tell us where or when the next pandemic will strike or how severe it will be. But most agree, at some point, we are likely to face another pandemic. In order for us to deal with that effectively, we have to put in place an infrastructure, not just here at home, but globally, that allows us to see it quickly, isolate it quickly, respond to it quickly. Our country has been given fair warning of this danger to our homeland and time to prepare. It's my responsibility as the president to take measures now to protect the American people from the possibility that human to human transmission may occur. So that if and when a new strain of flu like the Spanish flu crops up five years from now or a decade from now, we've made the investment. After the SARS outbreak, there was a stepped up effort to find where could this be happening elsewhere? Where could there be other animal viruses that might be spilling over into human populations? And the US government actually was financing an international effort to do that. Through that effort, they found like 900 different viruses that were actually starting to move into human populations. All right, thank you all. That program was actually abruptly ended in 2018 under the Trump administration. So that was sort of mistake number one. We stopped looking. Then the other thing the Trump administration did is, of course, dismantle the pandemic advisory team inside the White House. What they did was they basically took whatever was left of the pandemic response team at the NSC and they rolled into the nuclear weapons and weapons of mass destruction directorate. That means you're gonna have it under so the senior director who's basically doing nuclear weapons, chemical weapons, bioweapons, instead of making it a pandemic response question. This was clearly something that they did not see as a priority. When you make something smaller, when you shrink these positions and put them in under something else, you're gonna create less of a priority for them. And that was clearly the signal because the senior director responsible for nuclear proliferation is not going to make pandemic response his number one job. Their responsibility remained with someone at the White House, but having an entire team versus having one person is a huge difference. You said that you don't take responsibility, but you did disband the White House pandemic office and the officials that were working in that office left this administration abruptly. So what responsibility do you take to that? And the officials that worked in that office said that you that the White House lost valuable time because that office wasn't disbanded. What do you make of that? Well, I just think it's a nasty question because what we've done is, uh, and Tony had said numerous times that uh, we've saved thousands of lives because of the quick closing. Uh, and when you say me, I didn't do it. Uh, we have a group of people. I could I could ask perhaps my administration, but I could perhaps ask uh, Tony about that because I, I don't know anything about it. I mean, you say, you say we did that. I don't know anything you, about it. I sympathize with the desire to shrink the NSC, but this was the wrong decision to make. It was a fundamental misunderstanding of the threats the United States faces right now in the world. There's a key moment that's been written about a lot now in which the Obama administration is preparing the Trump administration for the transition, and they hold a session on pandemic planning, and the Trump administration shows zero interest in these plans. And later would complain the Obama administration never gave them a plan when they did have one, and there was a briefing that was ignored. The 15th case of uh, the coronavirus has been confirmed right here in the United States. And the CDC is warning that the virus is likely to impact the world for months to come and even beyond this year. The World Health Organization has given the disease caused by the coronavirus an official name, COVID-19. I've been through Ebola. I've been through 2009 H1N1. I've been through Zika. It started out the same way everything did, but then round about the middle of February, when we really should have been ramping up and testing more people, putting more people into isolation, going out into the community, doing a lot better contact tracing, we didn't. There is one main reason 
why we are where we are in the United States, and I call that the original sin, and that revolves around testing. We never had good visibility on where disease was in the United States and how it was spreading, and that's because we never had good testing. Especially early on, we need to know where circulation is occurring because that's where we want to intervene earliest with tracing interventions and trying to identify clusters and stop those clusters from growing. Where you're not getting testing uh, out in any appreciable capacity uh, really allows the virus to go into this, what you know, what's called an exponential phase. This is much like a forest fire, right? If you get to it when it's early and small, you can snuff it out. However, if you let it grow and expand, containment is much harder. This wasn't entirely preventable, but this level of transmission certainly was. First, the uh, CDC decided to make its own testing kit uh, rather than use one that was available uh, and used in other countries uh, from the WHO. Uh, second, they seem to have assembled it incorrectly. A recently published report says cross-contamination at the CDC lab in Atlanta may have delayed the rollout of COVID-19 testing kits. The Washington Post reporting the CDC put together the kits in the same lab space where it was handling synthetic coronavirus. According to the report, the distribution had to be put on hold until the CDC could redesign them, and that set the agency back about a month. The testing kits, you have a mistake in how you execute it from a science perspective. That's pretty shocking for the CDC. In all of the tabletop exercises looking at responses to an outbreak, no one ever anticipated that the testing wouldn't work. And so <laughs> it was uh, an unexpected challenge. CDC set such specific guidelines for who could and couldn't be tested that you literally couldn't, you could almost test no one. According to CDC guidelines for weeks, they only would test you if you had a contact with someone who had a you know, known case or who was from Wuhan. And this was after the virus had already spread to all these different countries. So we basically blinded ourselves. As we started having additional cases, it didn't make sense to me why they weren't widening the net. So it was allowed to spread and get really incorporated into the fabric of our society. Then you have leaks where you have scientists all over the country and labs saying, we can test, we don't need the CDC. We can do this ourselves, and the FDA not taking the necessary steps to let that happen. And this is where I think the leadership fails. Trying to get patients tested was very, very cumbersome. We were super reliant on public health agencies, and they were frustrated. And just waiting on you know, third-party testing, it just became a bottleneck. Only a relative handful of people in the U.S. have been tested thus far as compared to thousands of people in other countries where this uh, disease has broken out. You really want to be able to just say, anybody who needs a test can get a test. Anybody right now and yesterday, anybody that needs a test gets a test. We, they're there. They have the test. And the tests are beautiful. Yeah, uh, that was not true. Um, yeah. Now, the virus that we're talking about having to do, you know, a lot of people think that goes away in April with the heat. It's going to disappear. One day, it's like a miracle. It will disappear. Yes. And from our shores, we've, you know, it could get worse before it gets better. It could maybe go away. We'll see what happens. Nobody really knows. Well, we pretty much shut it down. President Trump, from his early days as a public figure, as a businessman, has very much been concerned with the appearance of things. And the hope that if the image is good, the good news will follow. Report today, the global death rate at 3.4 percent. Your reaction to that? Well, I think the 3.4 percent is really a false number. Now, this is just my hunch. The president's whole political persona came to bear on this crisis. And that political persona is based on creating his own reality making up his own set of facts that can represent the world as he wants it to be. And he has a whole media ecosystem that barks back those facts, that echoes those facts for him. This president will always put America first. He will always protect American citizens. We will not see diseases like the coronavirus come here. We will not see terrorism come here. And isn't that refreshing? If you listen to the mainstream media, it's time to buy the family burial plot, visit the cemetery. 
and it's all President Trump's fault. Or at least that's what the media mob and the Democratic extreme radical. There's tons of hyperbole and speculation, none of which is helpful at all. The entire problem we're having is due to panic, not the virus. This is a real battle between that idea that President Trump has that the perception matters with the actual science of the situation. President Trump is a figurehead of a political movement that doesn't believe in a government full of experts. It, quote unquote, they would tell you. It doesn't believe in a heavily funded NIH or a heavily funded CDC. These are part of what the Trump movement considers the deep state. From the very beginning, there's a philosophical bent against those agencies doing their jobs well. Now the Democrats are politicizing the coronavirus. You know that, right? Coronavirus. And this is their new hoax. But, you know, we did something that's been pretty amazing. We have 15 people in this massive country. And because of the fact that we went early, we went early, we have lost nobody to coronavirus in the United States. Nobody. All right, everyone, we have some uh, distressing news to share. It is breaking news regarding the coronavirus. We're going to go right now to NBC correspondent Scott Cohn. Scott, you've got this news. What is it? The news, Alex, is that in Washington state, they are confirming now the first U.S. death from COVID-19. A man in his 50s dying from COVID-19 infection in Washington state. Tonight, the governor of Washington declaring a state of emergency after the first known coronavirus death in the U.S. The president just wrapped up a press conference not too long ago saying that Vice President Mike Pence will actually be in charge of this coronavirus task force as the country looks at ways uh, in dealing with this outbreak altogether. Tonight, after nearly a week adrift in isolation and without answers, finally an end in sight. The Grand Princess is expected to dock Monday. Already 21 people are positive for coronavirus, thousands still untested. We are working closely with the Coast Guard, with the Center for Disease Control, and with the state uh, to uh, address this issue. That's a big decision. Do I want to bring all those people on? People would like me to do that. I don't like the idea of doing it. The president was pretty clear in some of his sort of offhand statements. You know, he has this habit of saying the quiet part out loud. For example, with the cruise ship, you know, they didn't want to disembark them. There was infections going on. And he openly said, like, look, I don't want to do all the testing of those people because then the numbers will go up. I like the numbers being where they are. I don't need to have the numbers double because of one ship. Do we get to get off the ship tomorrow and be quarantined someplace else? or? or what's gonna happen is the unknown. And I think that's the scariest not knowing what's gonna happen with us now. We're just hoping and praying that we test negative and that somehow this ship can get offloaded in time to get home. He wanted it to look a certain way, and that does mean messing with the testing data because then you can artificially keep the case numbers low, at least for some amount of time. When you do testing to that extent, you're gonna find more people, you're gonna find more cases. So I said to my people, slow the testing down, please. It's wrong. If you test more people in the long run, you have less sick people because you have less transmission. The coronavirus taking hold in the U.S. today. We're moving into uncharted territory practically by the hour. This country and some of its most venerable institutions, from pro sports leagues to Broadway to Disneyland, taking stunning measures to slow the spread of coronavirus. As the number of confirmed coronavirus cases continues to rise in the U.S., concerns over the supply of medical equipment continues to be a top concern. Doctors, nurses, and surgeons are at the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic response. But what happens when they're running low on personal protective equipment, or PPEs? We ran out of gloves in my hospital. Then we ran out of N95 respirators. Then they told us we had to reuse them. These are one-use items, all one-use items like gloves and respirators, which according to the manufacturer's instructions are, you use them one time and then you throw them out. You dispose of them properly. They're contaminated with virus. I don't want to get exposed and then I'll bring it to my family, to the public, to our community. Honestly, when I show up to work every day, 
It's very anxiety provoking. There's a couple of reasons why there wasn't enough protective equipment. Um, the first is that there simply wasn't enough stockpiled away. Hospitals don't have large warehouses where they have masks and gowns and gloves. And to an extent that's understandable, that equipment expires, so you don't want to waste it if it's not going to be used. But also the world's international winding labyrinthine supply chains that provide this equipment just broke in this pandemic. So a lot of protective equipment is produced in China. When China goes down at the start of a pandemic, the supply dries up and it can't be easily replenished because suddenly the entire world is asking for the same supplies. The same goes for the swabs that are used in testing. A lot of those were made by one major manufacturer in Italy, which was one of the European epicenters of the pandemic. We knew the healthcare system was weak for surge capacity and that's what played out. There was no ability to see these additional cases, there was no ICU beds, there were no ventilators, there was no PPE. There was this perfect storm, if you will, of PPE shortages, a lack of testing, and then suddenly March rolls around and, you know, we have a ton of cases and everybody's racing to catch up. New York State is now reeling from one of the largest coronavirus outbreaks in the country. Tonight, at least 28 people have died from the virus. Over 800 cases of COVID-19 have been recorded here in the U.S. In seven or eight weeks, there could be 64,000 of people infected in the state of Washington if we don't somehow slow down this epidemic. And the next week, it'd be 120,000. And the next week, it'd be a quarter million. Today, in order to contain the spread of the coronavirus. In the next phase of our continued effort to stay ahead of these changing circumstances. I've signed an executive order declaring a state of emergency. A state of emergency here in Colorado. A disaster proclamation for Illinois our version of a state of emergency. I actually just signed before I came in here um, a state of emergency declaration. The World Health Organization has declared the coronavirus a global pandemic. The agency says it's deeply concerned by the spread and severity of the illness and by the alarming levels of inaction. Hundreds of shoppers rush into a Los Angeles Costco this morning with this warning. Supplies are being rationed to keep up with the unprecedented coronavirus panic shopping. Nervous shoppers are emptying store shelves across the tri-state area of things such as cleaning products, toilet paper, water, even chicken. The fear is that there is a shortage triggering panic in the middle of this coronavirus pandemic. Suddenly they start to see all of these cases and there's a lot more media attention. The optics of it drastically change. Suddenly we realized how serious this was. Today I'd like to provide an update to the American people on several decisive new actions we're taking in our very vigilant effort to combat and ultimately defeat the corona vir virus. We've been working very hard on this. We've made tremendous progress. To unleash the full power of the federal government in this effort today, I am officially declaring a national emergency. lesson we learned from Ebola was that there has to be a preparedness system in place. In the early days of Ebola, there were resistance, distrust, and violence. The issue of the population, community, accepting the messages was critical. There are key behavior the community need to put in place if you're going to continue an outbreak. We had to introduce a hand washing and not shaking pants. There has to be a national political will, and it has to kick in robustly. It has to be an all government approach. You must have logistics and supply chain. 
and then the physician and the nurses must be trained. Before Ebola, there was not a robust public health surveillance system. And so we created the National Public Health Institute. There were active surveillance going on in all parts of the country that would pick up ongoing diseases and new diseases. We created a robust national reference lab with the molecular testing capacity. And all of the lab technicians had gained experience from Ebola, from running thousands and thousands of Ebola samples. And so basically, we now had a system to detect diseases and early warning system. We had a laboratory system to test. That was the key. When we heard that there was COVID-19 in Wuhan, China, on January the 22nd, we wrote an advisory to the Minister of Health, advising her that the threat in China will one day end up in Liberia and we need to prepare. It was the trauma of that devastation of Ebola that spurred everyone into action. Nobody wanted what happened to Liberia during the Ebola when we accounted for the highest number of cases and death. Nobody wanted it to happen to us. The political will was there. The silver lining of Ebola was helping us to prepare and understand the devastation potential of an outbreak. We collaborated with the US CDC to develop our epidemiology training program. As someone who was mentored by the U.S., it took me by surprise. I had explicit confidence in the U.S. CDC. So, honest to God, the extent to which it had gone, the U.S., I, I'm, I'm sure how things spiral out of control. This afternoon, we're announcing new guidelines for every American to follow over the next 15 days. Life outside the home or apartment has virtually shut down. Schools and businesses are closed, and the social fabric has been badly frayed. My administration is recommending that all Americans, including the young and healthy, work to engage in schooling from home when possible, avoid gathering in groups of more than 10 people, avoid discretionary travel, and avoid eating and drinking at bars, restaurants, and public food courts. And if we do this right, uh, our country and, and the world, frankly, but our country can be rolling again pretty quickly, pretty quickly. Tonight, the number of cases of the coronavirus has now soared past 17,000, one third of those cases here in New York City. And they think this is much higher. Of course, the testing still catching up and will likely reflect that number. As of tonight, there are at least 196 reported deaths related to COVID-19. The truth is, we are badly behind, of course. We're not ready for the worst of it, not even close. When it comes to the social distancing, it's really hard to convince people to completely stop their lives for something that they can't even see and that they're not experiencing yet. The reality is that you're asking people to stay home, give up everything that they love to do, and if they, everybody does it right, then nothing's going to happen. And so you'll know that it worked when nothing happened. Well, now to the national outlook. President Trump is considering a stunning move that could impact the spread of the coronavirus. I'd love to have it open by Easter. Okay, I would oh, love wow. to have it open okay. by Easter. I will, I will tell you that so, right now. I would love to have that. It's such an important day for other reasons, but I'll make it an important day for this too. I would love to have the country opened up and uh, just raring to go by Easter. Our country wasn't built to be shut down. This is not a country that was built for this. It was not built to be shut down. The message from the very top, from the president, was mixed to the point of farce. It would have to be in, in, a, in a pandemic textbook. It would be what not to do. President Trump holds a briefing in which they're urging Americans to wear masks. Yet the president of the United States says, I, however, will not be wearing one. This is voluntary. I don't think I'm going to be doing it. I'm feeling good. 
I just don't want to be doing. I don't know, somehow sitting in the Oval Office behind that beautiful Resolute desk, the great Resolute desk, I think uh, wearing a face mask as I greet presidents, prime ministers, dictators, kings, queens, I don't know, somehow I don't see it for myself. I just, I just don't. Mixed messaging is extremely damaging in terms of managing a pandemic. What is needed from governments or health authorities is a clear, consistent message. This is what this is, this is the level of severity, and this is what you have to do. Like, I can't criticize an average person for going to the beach when the president's saying it's going to magically go away when it's warm. So they think it's going to go away. Dr. Fauci, the head of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, on Friday having to temper President Trump's remarks about the possibility of using an anti-malaria drug to treat coronavirus patients. And I say it, what do you have to lose? I'll say it again, what do you have to lose? Take it, I really think they should take it. But it's their choice, and it's their doctor's choice or the doctors in the hospital. But hydroxychloroquine, try it. They thought a drug could protect them from coronavirus, but tonight an Arizona man is dead after he and his wife made a terrible mistake. Turns out the couple ingested chloroquine phosphate, which is actually used as a parasite treatment for fish. She said she'd heard about it from President Trump. It was even to the point where Dr. Fauci could kind of standing behind Trump, look at the camera a certain way so that then the news media could interpret that to debunk whatever nonsense was coming out of the president's mouth. Mrs. President, what do you say to Americans who are concerned that you're not taking this seriously enough and that some of your statements don't match what your health experts are saying? That's CNN, fake news. What do you say to Americans who are watching you right now who are scared? Uh, I say that you're a terrible reporter. That's what I say. President Trump has done very well with his base attacking the press. It's often a lashing out because the press is reporting things that he doesn't like seeing reported. It clashes with the safe information bubble he tries to live in. Mr. President, you said several times that the United States has ramped up testing, but the United States is still not testing per capita as many, res as many people as other countries like South Korea. Why is that, and when do you think that that number will be on par with other countries? Yeah. Rather than asking a question like that, you should congratulate the people that have done this testing. And you should be saying congratulations instead of asking a really uh, snarky question, because I know exactly what you mean by that. You should be saying congratulations to the men and women who have done this job, who have inherited a broken testing system, and who have made it great. The pandemic was the one time when it seemed that his anger at the press actually was costing him. Because no matter what their political persuasion was, people were desperate for pure, trustworthy information about the safety of their families. What we saw with COVID-19 was really a spotlight shed on the many socioeconomic disparities that had long existed in the United States. If you live in a majority black area in the United States, you're three times more likely to die of coronavirus than if you live in a white area. Black people in the United States are more likely to have these underlying health conditions that exacerbate the disease's deadly potential. Four out of five Black people do not have jobs where they can work from home. They had to continue going to jobs on assembly lines or as grocery store workers. They also returned to neighborhoods that were more dense in households that were largely multi-generational. That is a reflection of long-standing problems that have plagued the U.S. since its earliest times. Since the end of the U.S. Civil War, former slave states have deliberately pushed healthcare away from black communities, have disenfranchised and impoverished them, have left them without access to the same bizarre system of employer-tied insurance that white Americans have found it easier to take part in. 
And because of that, the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 upon black and brown communities is not only tragic, but entirely predictable. And at some point, something gives. After being shot five times, Brianna Taylor was alive, but struggling to breathe. Ahmaud Arbery was shot to death in February, apparently while jogging in his neighborhood outside Brunswick, Georgia. I'm going to tell them there's an African-American man threatening my life. I'll roll the window down. Man, I'm scared as fuck, man. Hey, when I start breathing, when I start breathing, it's going to go off on me, man. OK, 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 let me count to three. There is no way that you can extricate what happened with COVID-19 from the unrest that you're seeing on the streets regarding police brutality. Because you're seeing the continued impact of governments ignoring your needs and not feeling that they need to be held accountable. Dr. Fauci said earlier this week that the lag in testing was, in fact, a failing. Do you take responsibility for that? And when can you guarantee that every single American who needs a test will be able to have a test? What's the date of that? Yeah, no, I don't take responsibility at all because we were given a, uh, a set of circumstances and we were given rules, regulations, and specifications from a different time. Uh, wasn't meant for this kind of uh, an event uh, with the kind of numbers that we're talking about. And what we've done is redesigned it very quickly with the help of the people behind me. And we're now in very, very strong shape. This isn't just Trump's fault. Uh, like many other aspects of the pandemic, this is a reflection of long-standing vulnerabilities in America that have accumulated over years. The underfunding of public health, the um, lack of attention towards preparedness. The roots of our poor response in the U.S. predate the Trump administration. There are a lot of things we could talk about um, that go back 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. Donald Trump is central to America's problems with this pandemic, but he is not wholly responsible. Many of America's problems are long-standing ones and must now be addressed. There is a foundational rot in the country currently affecting the lives of its citizens. In New York, a scene reminiscent of 9-11. A makeshift morgue set up outside a hospital, ready for an influx of bodies. New York City is now the epicenter of the American outbreak, with a third of all cases. Uh, I want America to understand, this week, it's going to get bad. And uh, we really need to come together as a nation. Officials are preparing for hospitals to be overrun. They say they need close to 90,000 beds. At a single hospital in Queens, 13 deaths in one day. President Trump was once again optimistic that we have enough respirators on hand. But Governor Cuomo of New York said that New York only has about 5,000 ventilators and that the state would require more like 30,000. I don't believe you need 40,000 or 30,000 ventilators. He basically yesterday accused the hospital of padding the numbers they need because they were trying to sell or sending out the back door the masks. How do you go from using 20,000 masks to 300,000 masks? Can't be done. Go investigate that. You go investigate that. You have your military or FEMA investigate that. That's your job. We're competing for ventilators with FEMA and the federal government. So Illinois is bidding for ventilators against the federal government. Prices are being uh, ratcheted up on what should be a national crisis where we should be coming together. The New York Times reports that on a conference call with the state governors today, Trump told them they would have to try to get some life-saving medical equipment on their own. We've been working really hard to do that. We're bidding against one another. It's really not a great system. Uh, Michigan, all she does is she has no idea what's going on. And all she does is say, oh, it's the federal government's fault. And we've taken such great care of Michigan. Once you do have a contract, you can find out later that it will evaporate because uh, you'll be told that the federal government needs some material. FEMA says we're sending 400 ventilators. Really? What am I going to, what am I going to do with 400 ventilators when I need 30,000? 
And with them, it's just political. How's Trump doing? Oh, well, I don't know. You know, let's blame. Because we have done, we have done a job the likes of which nobody's seen. You picked the 26,000 people who are going to die because you only sent 400 ventilators. This is going to be like having many Katrinas. This is going to be a reality where you're going to have many cities simultaneously, many states simultaneously in crisis, needing health care professionals, needing ventilators. There is no national structure to address this right now. The 11 people that have died in the nursing home in Anderson, Indiana, it's really hard to think about and grasp what is happening around our state, too. A loved one dies from COVID-19, and you can't be there to say goodbye. These, these are people that should be appreciated. He calls all the governors. I tell him, I mean, I'm a different type of person. I say, Mike, don't call the governor of Washington. You're wasting your time with him. Don't call the woman in Michigan. Well, it doesn't make any difference what happens. The governor of Washington? No, no, you know what I say? If they don't treat you right, I don't call. Hospitals have been using these refrigerated trucks to store the bodies of COVID-19 patients because the morgues here in New York City are almost already full. At this pace, a person is dying from COVID-19 in New York every two and a half minutes. That is the biggest meltdown I have ever seen from a president of the United States uh, in my career. He sounds like he is out of control. Has any governor agreed that you have the authority to decide when their state I haven't asked up? anybody because but I no don't, you know why? Because I don't have to. Go ahead, please. But who told you the president has the total authority? Enough. Dr. Adams, the U.S. is now reporting 30,000 new cases a day. <laughs> This is going to be the hardest and the saddest week of most Americans' lives, quite frankly. This is going to be our Pearl Harbor moment, our 9-11 moment, only it's not going to be localized. It's going to be happening all over the country. And I want America to understand that. Did you know I was number one on Facebook? And I just found out I'm number one on Facebook. I thought that was very nice. It's like a war zone. With, we, we're in a war with very limited resources. Even with efforts across the country to try to slow the spread, the president of the United States. The New York Times reported yesterday that, that you and other top officials wanted to recommend social and physical distancing guidelines to President Trump as far back as the third week of February, uh, but the uh, administration didn't announce such guidelines to the American public until March 16th, almost a month later. Why? You know, Jake, as I've said many times, we look at it from a pure health standpoint. We make a recommendation. Often the recommendation is taken. Sometimes it's not. But we, it is what it is. We are where we are right now. It's the what would have, what could have. It, it, it's very difficult to, to go back and say that. I mean, obviously, if we had, right from the very beginning, shut everything down, it may have been a little bit different. But there was a lot of pushback about shutting things down back then. Good morning and welcome to Sunday today on this April 12th and Easter Sunday, unlike any of us ever has celebrated. The U.S. now has surpassed Italy as the country with the most total deaths from coronavirus. More than 20,000 people have died of COVID-19. More than half a million Americans have contracted the virus. This is probably the saddest time I've ever experienced. It's unending. Um, the grief and pain we're seeing every day here is enormous. Even as a nurse, I could not get into the hospital and uh, wear everything that I needed to wear to hold his hand and tell him goodbye and that I loved him and that he would be okay. 2.04 Wednesday morning, I woke up to my phone ringing and it was the hospital. And I, before I even answered it, I just said, oh God. So in a time frame of about five to six hours, I was informed um, on the phone by two separate doctors that each one of my parents wasn't gonna make it. They told me Thursday night, she had a fever of 101.4. He had to be put on a ventilator uh, that Friday night, and I couldn't see my dad. 
we lost my mom and my dad two hours, of, uh, less than two hours apart. Before he passed, the doctor did um, put the phone up to his ear and um, we were able to let him know how much we loved him. She said to me, Mom, no one's showing up to work. They're short staffed. Mom, I have to take my own hand sanitizer because there's none available. There's no gloves available, Mom. Helping seniors to put their grocery in their cart. Helping seniors to go to the restroom. He was well loved by everybody. It's the best you can ask for from a child. To receive another call right after we buried Nikki. I begged him not to leave us and I I told him that we all needed him and, and I thanked him. I thanked him for being the most amazing husband and for making me feel cherished and loved every single day. And Leilani's paycheck, I got her paycheck yesterday. My paycheck yesterday for $20, $20, $20. $20 and 64 cents. My baby's gone because of $20 and 64 cents. You know what? You know what I'm talking about? The specter of death won't be changed because the president says the virus is going to go away. Nothing can bring back the city councilman, the local bus driver, the friends and family that are now gone. And that's a very serious thing that the administration has to contend with. For the first time in history, all 50 states are under a major disaster declaration this morning. On Saturday, President Trump declared Wyoming a disaster area. That is the last state to receive the designation. My group and I, we've done a lot of work studying respiratory viruses over the last 10 years. And some of that work involves mathematical modeling and developing systems so that we can ingest data and then generate forecasts. And what we're able to see is the effects of all the social distancing that have been put in place over time. So then we said, what if the political and public will had been in place that we had responded one week earlier? And the consequence is more than 35,000 fewer deaths would have occurred simply because you would have caught it during that exponential growth period. And if you take it back two weeks, it's even more. Now, the reality is that's a very disturbing finding. for taking on things that seem impossible and just going for it. That's what I wanted us to do. I don't know if we would have been successful, but we could have really tried. I think that it would have been good to try. The question now is whether America can emerge from the ashes of this current tragedy. If you take the painful lessons from 9-11, it had a dramatic effect on the American psyche. It really codified terrorism as the singular threat that occupied the minds of an entire generation. It defined the way America thought about fear, uh, about uh, courage and resistance going forward. The COVID-19 pandemic has the potential to do that. It might make people think harder about the need for public health, the value of science and empiricism. But I hope more than that, I hope that it also shows people how many long-standing institutions of American life are broken. 
the U.S. was always seen as the gold standard. And so how is it that these institutions that are so capable for so long and are seen as the world leaders on this fail so badly? And the ultimate answer is leadership. Mr. President, the other day you said that you were not responsible for the testing shortfall. Very simple question. Does the buck stop with you? And on a scale of 1 to 10, how would you rate your response to this crisis? I'd rate it a 10. I think we've done a great job.